I am uh, Maria Jose Calderón, and I will be chairing the seminar today. Isabel Guillamón is our Zoom host. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, use this chat uh, to write them, or at the end of the seminar, raise your hand, and we will open the mic uh, for you to ask the questions directly. Well, it is my pleasure uh, to introduce our speaker today, Tobias Stauber from ICMM, uh, Instituto de Ciencia de Materiales de Madrid. Uh, he did his PhD in the University of uh, Heidelberg, and besides ICMM, where he was a postdoc after his PhD, he has been at the uh, University of Minho, Universidad Autónoma de Madrid, and the uh, University of Oxford. Uh, Tobias is a condensed matter theorist studying emergent phenomena in quantum materials. In particular, he works on uh, graphene and twisted band the uh, heterostructures uh, with wide expertise in the study of correlations and topological properties, as well as nanophotonics and plasmonics. Uh, today, he's going to tell us about uh, correlated phases in multilayer graphene. Thanks, Tobias. Uh, the screen is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Maria Jose, for, for this introduction. Um, I will talk about correlated phases in these um, twisted multilayer graphene. And before I start with my um, with my um, with my results um, that were recently done, let me um, highlight some recent experimental advances. And this is a very biased view because um, it is also related to some previous work of mine. So um, let me start with the phase diagram of the cuprates um, in a very sketchy way. Um, you probably have seen it all. There's this mod insulator phase um, very close to um, half filling. Then when you dope your system, this is usually whole doped, um, you reach this pseudo gap phase, and um, then at lower temperatures, you have the superconducting dome. And then in this over doped regions, you have this Fermi liquid behavior. Now, it was a great um, excitement to see a very similar phase diagram in twisted bilayer graphene um, about four years ago in the group of Pablo Jarillo Herrero, where they also see these superconducting domes, which are separated by this correlated gap states here, mod insulator, and, and again, a superconducting dome. It was um, exciting because at this, um, with this system, one could really, um, with the same sample, scan through the whole um, doping regime and change the phases just by a simple gate. And um, this made things much easier because um, previously in high TC materials, each doping regime had to be um, addressed by a different sample. And of course, um, this um, was more difficult um, in the end to, to explain all the little details because of course, every sample is a bit different especially when you dope your system um, in a different way. So this was a great um, excitement and this phase diagram has been also seen and recovered by many other groups. This is the, the group, um, the, the phase diagram by Dimitri Efetov's group where you see many of the superconducting domes in this um, density regime um, related to the so-called flat band regime. So the density is here um, given in units of, in, in two dimensions, it's always 10 to the 12th. Um, inverse centimeter squared. And um, as, you, as you gauge your system through this um, density regime, you see many different um, superconducting regions and also these correlated gaps um, all over the place. And I will um, use um, also um, frequently in this talk, the so-called um, occupation number um, or filling factor, um, which is related to the, the four different flavors which you can fill into this um, band of the moray um, pattern. And it is related to two degrees of freedom um, with respect to spin and two degrees of freedom with respect to the value. So minus four means that the, the, the valence band is completely empty. And um, then you fill your, your system with um, electrons and N equals zero would be then the, the neutrality point, the, the, the point um, where no extra charges have been added. Now, um, I have skipped one big regime. It's probably a bit exaggerated here. Um, the so-called strange metal regime um, in the phase diagram of cuprates, which is interesting because it does not um, have the typical um, temperature dependence um, um, for the resistivity. It is linear and not square 
uh, square um, dependence as in a normal Fermi liquid. And also you have this so-called Planckian dissipation, which only depends on the scattering rate um, with respect, I mean, only the temperature and really um, universal constants um, are giving. And this is so-called the crossover um, to the hydrodynamic regime where the Drudev model um, in a way failed. So, so these things have been um, seen for a long time in high TC qubits and it was great to also see this um, feature in these um, twisted bilayer samples. It has been seen by two different groups by again, Pablo Jaria Herrero um, also the group by Andrea Young, they see this linear dependence, but you can also see that there's some kind of um, um, difficulties in, in seeing this clearly because you cross these correlated, um, um, correlated insulator states. So you see here the, the um, resistivity rises and um, Andrea Young even um, favored and interpreted it um, also in, in a different way, um, Pablo Jarillo clearly saw indication for um, electron mediated pairing mechanism, whereas Andrea Young's group um, favored electron phonon um, um, mechanisms. And both were in a way um, compatible with these two experiments. So it was a great um, advance that um, Dimitri Afitov's group was able to simplify um, the, the results considerably um, he was placing very close um, nearby gates and he was screening out by this all these correlated um, insulator phases. As you can see, um, only the superconducting domes can now be um, are present and, and all the other um, insulating phase um, are just gone by these nearby gates. And by this, um, he was able to see this linear behavior down to very low temperatures, down to, to millikelvin. And this is a clear indication now um, that um, electron-electron interaction is at work here and electron phonon can just not be there um, due to the thermal activation there and the Grüneisen scale, block scale. Now, you can even enhance it more and um, the results, you can also um, look at the superconducting dome, you see some magnetic resistance, which is also linear, and they end up with the following phase diagram that you have the strange metal regime actually all over the band, and only at the band edges you have this Fermi liquid regime. And this, for our, um, in our opinion, um, is a clear indication that uh, the strong coupling approach, which is related to, so the superconductivity is related to the correlated gap regime, um, is, is very unlikely, and it is really a, a weak coupling approach, which is, um, which is um, um, ju justified. Now, um, many other results that have been seen in, um, um, in twisted bilayer graphene have also been seen in dicaicochonides, even some, some sort of superconducting states or almost superconducting state, at least um, very much suppression of, of uh, resistivity, and also this um, strange metal regime here, um, also with this um, um, crossover to this uh, Fermi liquid regime. Um, so it would be nice to have a unified theory and, and an idea what this is all about. And we have presented this in these two, two works um, where we make responsible extended van Hove singularities for this behavior. Extended van Hove singularities means that um, you have very almost one dimensional segments in the band structure. Um, these coefficients alpha and beta of the van Hove singularity are very different. Almost one is almost zero. And this means that this susceptibility is very much enhanced and can give rise to now this cone Lattinger um, instability and also to this marginal Fermi liquid. Now, the important thing is um, to note this has been done with a non interacting band structure. We now know that interactions are actually very important. Um, but still, the, the important thing is that the scale um, is very much enhanced and leads the scale that is seen in experiments. And so this is kind of the, um, the, 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 take, of, the take home message of these um, calculations that this cone Lattinger um, mechanism can really reach very considerably, um, relatively very high um, temperatures. Now, um, I told you that it was a great um, advanced to have these superconducting phenomena in twisted bilayer graphene because it made it possible to have doping 
um, um, to, to have one sample and doping through the sample and by, by, by gate, um, by applying a gate. And now still these twisted samples showed a lot of disorder and no sample is really the same. You have different patches with different twist angles and so on. So um, can one simplify even further this phenomena? And, and, and indeed it was possible. Um, Andrea Young groups um, showed that superconductivity can also be seen in a purely crystalline system. This time it was rhombohedral graphene. Um, it is um, a trilayer system A, B, C stacked. And um, you can see that the dispersion is kind of having here these wiggles these so-called Mexican hats, and um, this is very close to a Van Hove singularity that shoots up the density of states. And um, this is responsible probably for these um, superconducting regions that can now be seen in a purely crystalline system. So can, can one even be more, more reduced or more, more simple? And it is indeed the case, um, even for burned by the bilayer stacked graphene, um, superconductivity is now been seen. So it seems to be um, very much um, um, spread if you just look hard enough. So you, here you have AB stacked um, bilayer. Um, when you apply an um, out of plane or perpendicular displacement field, you see these wiggles again. And these wiggles give rise to a strong enhancement of the, um, of the density of states. And then um, for bilayer graphene, it is important to apply an um, in-plane magnetic field. And this then gives rise to these superconducting um, regions in the, in, the, in the phase diagram. Um, we did uh, a theory for this very long time ago, we looked at these um, uh, Landau um, uh, for, for, for these Mexican hat dispersion. Um, this um, gives rise to a different ground state. You have not a Fermi C, but a Fermi ring. Now it's called annular Fermi surface. And we discussed this. Actually, one can see also ferromagnetism that is seen in experiment. And we also show that there's a very strong um, um, susceptibility um, in this quasi one dimensional system, um, also the, the particle hole spectrum looks very uh, much like a one dimensional system. And so this is, uh, this is um, one of the ingredients that might be at work in these um, superconducting instabilities. Now, let me just to, to wrap up the, this, this very broad overview. Um, let me also highlight that not only magnetic phases, superconducting phases, um, correlated insulator phases have been seen in these van der Waals metals, but also ferroelectricity. So um, I think this is also a very nice example that all these phase um, um, breaking phases can actually be seen. Um, you have here boron nitride. If you stack it in such a way that the boron atom is just on top of the nitrogen atom, you can actually um, achieve that um, there's a spontaneous polarization that electrons um, um, are on the bottom layer, um, holes are on the top layer, and you, you see this hysteresis cur um, curve in the ferroelectricity. electricity. So this is just um, to for, for um, widen a bit um, this, this view that there's more than just superconductivity or magnetism. But um, let me go back to what is the basic ingredients that is needed to induce now superconductivity in these van der Waals materials. Um, I have kind of, this is a personal view, of course, but I have kind of shown you that van, der, van Hove singularities are really um, present, um, almost uh, mandatory in all these systems. And this uh, hints very much that the um, cone Lattinger mechanism can, can be very effective. And there's another thing um, which is um, probably not as much um, appreciated so far, and that there seems to be the need of some intrinsic or extrinsic chirality. Um, I showed you here, um, rhombohedral graphene is actually a an, um, topological insulator. Um, so it's topological and non-trivial. It has some chirality here. The only way of having superconductivity is with an in-plane um, magnetic field. So there is also some external chirality. And in the case of um, twisted bilayer graphene, you have some intrinsic chirality. And this has been demonstrated also in experiments where you see um, this circular, circular dichroism without breaking any time reversal symmetry 
um, um, by a magnetic field, for example. So you can twist your sample to the left or to the right. And depending on that uh, different rotation direction, um, you can scatter left-handed right, uh, left circularly polarized light or right-handed circularly polarized light differently. This was also nicely discussed by, by Louis Bray from, from ICMM. And um, our question was, um, are these um, effects also there for DC transport? Because all this was in the optical regime at finite frequency. And indeed, um, we, we looked at transport and we saw um, in transport um, these regions where there's a, a lot of um, current flowing in different directions in the different layers, which gives rise to a magnetic moment, which can be now tuned. And um, this gives rise to kind of an electrical control of magnetic excitation. So this is um, um, an interesting um, a phenomena to be experimentally verified. Another thing that is curious about these systems that and even the Onsaga relation tells you that the longitudinal conductivity cannot depend on, um, the, on the linear um, term of the magnetic field. We observe in, in our simulations that there's a different conductance if you go from left to right or to right to left with a magnetic field applied. And it is clearly linear um, in, in the magnetic field, this chirality, and this gives rise to a magnetic control of electric current. All this work has been done um, with, with Guillermo um, Gomez Santos um, from, from the C3. And also um, um, we worked together on another proposal, um, which is worked, um, which is kind of um, motivated and inspired by the work by FJ and Johannes Feist. Um, where they um, propose the polaronic chemistry due to strong light matter interaction. And in these chiral systems, in these chiral wonderwall systems, um, we, can, we could show that this light is actually chiral and this can give another degree of freedom where you can now maybe catalyze um, newly um, chiral molecules and even, even maybe ask and answer the question why there's only left-handed um, amino acids in, in nature and, and not the other enantiomer um, species. So with this, I come to the, to the outline of, of my talk. I will talk about um, these twisted samples. And before I will start um, to presenting our results, I will give you a brief um, introduction of why um, you have these magic angles and, and what, it, what is it all about. I will then talk about a phase diagram in bilayer graphene, um, superconductivity in trilayer graphene. And if there's time, I will also talk about these um, quadrilayer um, results and hopefully obtain some kind of universal answer and or um, um, result that, that really kind of unifies all these different layers um, in a way. Um, before I start, let me also highlight um, and make some announcement and, and advertisement um, to the summer school um, at ICFO. It is organized by Pablo Jario Herrero, who spends a sabbatical at ICFO, and the deadline is already the 15th of May. So um, if one of your students are interested, they, they have to hurry up, but it might be a nice um, um, summer school um, um, at Barcelona. So um, magic angle graphene, all these phenomena um, happen because there's the so-called flat angle regime and which um, suppresses kinetic energy and therefore interaction effects become important. Now, um, how can this be understood? Um, we can start with two Dirac cones in different layers. And um, they are separated in K-space because of the rotation. So the K-space moves in, um, um, with respect um, to the other layer. And um, they now touch at some certain point here, um, the two layers. And since there's interaction between the two layers, hopping interaction, there will be a level of repulsion. So let's see now the scales, which are important. Um, the first scale is the separation of the two Dirac cones. We have, um, this is um, proportional to, to theta and um, the crossing or the, the moray energy is just 
half of this separation um, times the um, Fermi velocity. So this gives you the scale of the moray, which is dependent on the twist angle. And the other scale, which is important, is this Van Hove singularity, which is just the moray cell minus this um, level repulsion, minus the, um, the, the antibonding term um, due to the interaction between the two legs. Now, what you want to have is you want to have this one really pushed down to zero. So this is the, 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 the flat band um, regime where you could expect some correlation effects. And you can do this. You just um, um, change now either this scale or this scale. So this one is easier experimentally, just change this twist angle. And then you will always reach some kind of resonant regime where this is zero. And when you plug in the numbers, you actually end up very nicely to this 1.08 where um, this magic um, angle or this twist angle is really um, seen experimentally. Now, this is a universal mechanism. It is independent of graphene. You can also have a parabolic band here. Um, you can have um, magnetic systems and um, superconducting systems, um, topological systems. All this should actually be um, the same, at least partially. You should have flat bands at some um, resident conditions. As long as the, 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 the symmetry point or the neutrality point is not at the gamma point. So you have to be able to change it by rotation or change it by twisting or um, then by, by, by bending or stretching. So you can also do, do some other kind of um, um, actions where you can change the, the point in case space. Then you will always have this kind of um, um, condition and therefore, I think this 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 um, this insight that experimentally one can actually control this um, has been very important and will be will be um, important um, for the for the next um, couple of years at least. So um, let me um, again highlight then that by this the first correlated states were seen by the group of um, Pablo Jaria Herrero, um, where the single particle band structure, which is of course not totally flat, but it does have some dispersion, does not show any gap here, but experimentally in the transport to terminal conductance, one can see this, this gap very clearly. Now, um, it has been noticed by Eslam Galaf um, in, at Harvard and, and collaborators um, that um, this magic angle is not confined to, two only, to only two layers, but you can extend it to, to many layers and actually infinitely many layers. And in theory, at least for the continuum model, for some um, continuum model. And when you have alternating twist angles, then you can map this system to the flat band of, um, of um, two layer um, magic angle um, graphene. And the very important and um, nice um, fact for our theoreticians is that this twist angle becomes larger for these um, multi-layer systems. So for tri-layer, the twist angle is now multiplied by square root of two. For quadrilayer, it would be multiplied by this um, golden ratio. So even though you have an additional layer, which is of course uh, more atoms, more degrees of freedom, the twist angle becomes larger. And so the Moray superperiodicity becomes smaller. And therefore you can still do your numerical um, treatment by this. Sometimes it's even easier to treat many layers um, or two, three or four layers than, than two layers. And um, this is of course a good news um, for all um, theorists um, working on this numerically. Now it has been seen experimentally. And um, so superconductivity with a very similar phase diagram has been seen. You see here an optimal doping at, at minus 2.5 um, filling factor, and then it fades away at, at about three, um, minus three hole doping. And um, the twist angle is now is not 1.08, but it is 1.6 where all this is seen. So um, what is our theory for this? Um, I, um, try to motivate you what we believe um, is at work. We believe that it's not phonomediated pairing mechanism, but that it's an electronic mediated pairing me mechanism. Um, 
it's not a strong coupling approach, but a weak coupling approach um, that should be um, performed. And then in the end, um, one can always think about effective models, but we prefer to really work with microscopic models in order not to lose any effects that might be missing um, in these effective models. So our approach is the following. We, we have a tight binding model. Um, we have an in-plane hopping um, term. We have um, the term which connects the two layers or the three layers or the four layers. And we have a slater costa parameterization that has been um, um, given by, uh, that has been taken from this um, nice work um, of Ivan Bruyvega. Um, who was one of the first that really worked on these systems with STM and, um, and provided the, the experimental um, data for, for these parameters. Important is now um, to also include interactions. And let me comment that normally Hubbard interactions can be neglected because when you, when you consider a, a Moray cell, which, is, uh, which has many atoms, um, a scaling argument shows you that the Hubbard interaction is actually the effective Hubbard interaction is suppressed by the number of atoms. And um, long range interaction is only suppressed by the square root of the number of atoms. So it's actually the long range interaction that um, is important. Nevertheless, if you want to have some um, polarization or spin phases, um, one has to include uh, Hubbard interaction. And um, it is now important to really um, um, choose the parameters between the short range Hubbard interaction and the long range Coulomb interaction. Now, furthermore, um, we, we have a Coulomb interaction which is partially screened and, and by this um, parameter Xi, um, which denotes the distance of the gates um, um, close to the sample, which is always there in order to, to control the, the electronic density. So um, we use this um, long range interaction and it is all um, parameterized by this um, dielectric constant delta. And as I told you, it's very important to have this um, relative value um, right and also the absolute value. And um, so we did in, intrinsic screening um, calculations. So in, in order to, to, to obtain the intrinsic screening, we, we did these calculations and um, we obtain like epsilon equals 50. And this is obtained from a non-interacting band structure, but importantly for the interacting band structure, we then also obtain an um, internal screening of epsilon equals 50. So there's self-consistency and we are, optim uh, we are optimistic that this is really the correct and realistic number. Now with this, I can come to the phase diagram, interest the bilayer graphene. And um, before I go to the phase diagram of twisted bilayer graphene, let me remind you briefly on the phase diagram of graphene itself. So graphene um, is this honeycomb lattice um, modeled by, by, by this um, hopping only to um, nearest neighbors. We have here these three hoppings and um, you probably all know that this gives rise to a Dirac cone, and we have always two copies um, for, for this one valley and for the other valley. And um, you can now add a mass term um, on these two different sub lattices. And this opens up here this gap. And um, in one valley, it is topologically non trivial. Um, you have a churn number of one half, but if you add them up with the other valley, you then um, obtain a, a chiral gap or a trivial gap in, in, this, um, in this system. Now you can also make this um, non-trivial, this gap, and this has been this insight by, by Haldane, by introducing this flux between atoms of the same um, sublattice. And if they are all um, directed in such a way that you have this flux inside this unit cell, um, you obtain a gap which is now adding up for the two valleys, which is non-trivial and has a churn number one. Um, you can now also have the flux, um, oh, sorry, I'm, I'm, um, you can now add a, a mass term and you can close one gap here and open up the other one twice. 
And this kind of gives rise to this so-called parity anomaly. It seems that you have only one Dirac cone now with a churn number one half, which is of course um, forbidden by um, due to, to this integer value of the churn number. And um, the paradox can be resolved by combining now or joining these two bands in the high energy region. And of course, then you, you end up with, an, with a churn number, which is integer. Um, but what I wanted to tell you um, is you can also now have also um, a different phase only involving these, these, these currents when you direct them differently. So this time one is going this direction, the other one in this, they hit here. And what happens now is the so-called symmetry, um, valley symmetry break, broken state, where you shift the two Dirac cones up and down. Now, um, this is now an exercise. You can combine them all. You can combine the valley and the Cairo symmetry um, breaking system. You can combine the valley and the holding symmetry breaking um, phase, and you can combine them all together. And um, this is what we believe the final answer, actually, what we see in twisted bilayer graphene effectively. So we, we have all of these three symmetry broken states and they connect and interestingly, we see one, um, one um, gap is open and the other one is closed. So um, for bilayer graphene, um, we have to double these order parameters. We have to have always a positive and then um, anti um, a symmetric and anti-symmetric um, um, combination. And then we have a Cairo symmetry breaking, holding symmetry breaking, well, valley, hold, um, valley symmetry breaking, broken state. And these are now the, the results for twisted bilayer graphene without Hubbard U. So what we see is that um, for the weak coupling regime, we have a phase which is clearly showing this holding gap, but then there's a phase transition and the Cairo gap becomes dominant in the strong coupling regime. And there's a difference if you have the pure Coulomb or the screen Coulomb, which I showed you before. So you, these details really important, are important also in the phase diagram. Now, let me add a um, Hubbard U. So we will expect um, magnetic phases, but if Hubbard U is small, actually we don't see so much of um, spin polarization. We see more rather um, valley um, symmetry broken state. But if we now add or we, we, we crank up the, the Hubbard interaction, we see a totally polarized um, state for, for the recoupling regime and then and, and some kind of second order phase transition maybe. And um, so um, clearly um, the Hubbard U can induce a magnetic um, um, phase, um, ferromagnetic state here. Now, this is to be expected, actually. Andreas Milke here um, um, in the 90s has presented a, um, the a mathematical theorem. There are not so many mathematical theorems that, that are um, involving the Hubbard model. So this is one of the few um, examples. And he showed, actually, that ferromagnetism has always be, uh, to be there for flat bands. And we, um, we proved his theorem numerically for the twisted bilayer graphene. And we, we, we showed, I mean, the proof is that the density matrix has to be irreducible. And we showed this numerically that this is the case. We can also see this now self-consistently in the hartree fock scheme. And um, for twist angles um, away from the magic angle, we see just no polarization, also not in this order parameter. This is the Holden order parameter. But when we are at the magic angle, we see this clear polarization. We see the perfect um, um, filling of only one um, spin projection. And then only after everything has been filled up at the neutrality point, the other spin direction is also filled. And interestingly, we see it also in the, in the Holden um, order parameter. So there's also some, some features. So this kind of suggests that there's a strong connection between spin ferromagnetism and orbital ferromagnetism. And the, the polarization is very concentrated um, at the center of the Moray cell. Now, um, we were very happy to see this, but then we did um, calculations 
which are more involved because um, with the self-consistency and since these systems are very big and we only considered like 20 bands around the charge neutrality point. If you now consider more of these bands, suddenly um, at, the, at the neutrality point, this ferromagnetism um, breaks down in both um, cases. So for the spin polarization, but also for the Haldane um, parameter. So um, our so so was the theorem of, of Andreas Mikre was it wrong? Of course not. Um, but um, he always assumed that the Stoner criterion is fulfilled for a flat band, which is logically. But here we don't have a perfectly flat band. We have these Dirac cones, and um, close to the neutrality point, the Stoner criterion is not fulfilled. And this is the, the explanation why there is no ferromagnetism. So one has to be very careful how many bands um, one includes and how strong the Hubbard U is. And just to give you a kind of intuition is that um, if the Hubbard U is, is reasonably small, which acts only on the flat band region, then we would expect these, these theorems um, for flat bands um, to hold. But if now U is larger, you also have to take the remote bands into, in, into account. And um, then you will actually have a um, antiferromagnetic um, super exchange or kinetic super exchange, which leads to an antiferromagnetic coupling. And this is what we see. So the, the, st the ground state is actually antiferromagnetic. And um, this might be the reason why no ferromagnetic um, spin state has been seen in, in twisted bilayer graphene. And um, we wanted to check how does this really scale in our calculation scheme. And we see some kind of finite scaling. So we always expect some spin polarization, perfect spin polarization for the recoupling regime. But um, um, one has to really consider a lot of bands. And, and if, you, if one does not so, um, one exaggerates, one, one exaggerates um, strongly this tendency to, to a polarized spin um, state in twisted bilayer graphene. Now, let me come to superconductivity um, in twisted bilayer graphene. And um, it just um, I mentioned before, we have the bilayer system um, where we have these flat bands. And one can now map in the continuum model this to the trilayer system. If this is possible, um, for this to be possible also in the tight binding model, it is crucial to include um, corrugations. Um, what we have done, and only then we can have this mapping. So this is different um, from the continuum model. You see it is reasonably similar. One big um, difference is, of course, this Dirac cone here, which is decoupled from the flat bands due to a different symmetry um, representation with respect to the parity um, reflection symmetry on, on the layers. And um, we don't have to really consider this, this Dirac cone in our calculations. Now, what we do is we do a Hartree Fock calculation and we place our Fermi level um, at this um, half filled um, valence band, n equals minus two. And this is the non interacting band structure. And now, when we do this um, self consistent scheme, we see that a gap opens up. And this gap um, now, so this is the, the old um, Dirac cone. We have um, this is the initial position of the Dirac cone. It is a doubly degenerate. One of these Dirac cone has been shifted up. So there's valley symmetry breaking. And the other Dirac cone has now opened up in a gap. So there's this, this Haldane phase um, also associated with a, with a chiral gap phase. And this is independent of, um, of the epsilon. So we see it for um, smaller epsilon and for larger epsilon. So we are um, optimistic that this is really a, a very robust feature. And it can also be explained from the strong coupling regime. The strong coupling regime um, assumes that we have eight flat bands to start with, and totally flat bands. Um, these flat bands are labeled by the valley, by the sub um, lattice, and by the spin polarized state. And um, they have a turn number of one or minus one because um, I showed you before um, in the Dirac cone, in, in the Dirac model, it was turn one half and minus one half. Here we have two layers, and therefore we have turn numbers one and minus one. And they are related now to symmetries. And if we now 
by hand break these symmetries, we can have, um, for example, this state he occupied, and this would mean that only this um, state here um, is filled up. And um, this would lead to a um, 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 hall um, and to, to a Holden um, insulator with churn number um, two. And we have actually the same also in our um, order parameter, but this time it's not by hand, but it's really what comes out from the calculation. So we can um, justify the, the strong coupling approach by our microscopic calculation. We see that there's a strong um, valley symmetry broken state, which is associated also to the uh, to the Holden symmetry broken state and the chiral broken um, state. So all of these uh, states are actually um, condensated. Now, um, the important thing is the valley symmetry broken state. So this seems to be the strongest one in that, that one that drives the transition. And you can see this also in the, um, in the band structure, the K point and the K prime point, they are very different. And so the C6 symmetry is really broken. Now, what is interesting is um, that there's also um, a totally different behavior, whether you have a spin up or a spin down polarization. Um, and you see that there is a um, locking um, of the valley. So um, for spin um, one half, you cannot really make a spin flip to, to, to up because you would, uh, you would have a, a momentum mismatch. And um, the, the spin down in valley K um, would be spin up in valley K prime. And this has a very important consequences um, because now um, this protects um, a spin flip. If you, for example, apply an in-plane magnetic field, the only possibility would be a spin flip. Orbital motions are suppressed, so you cannot have any orbital um, transitions. And um, this, this protects your, um, the Cooper pairs. Um, with respect to spin flip and, and, and you have to apply a strong magnetic field, which is clearly um, is, um, um, exceeding the Pauli limit. And we made some estimations that the Pauli limit is actually violated by fact two or three, which is um, very close to what is seen in the experiment. So our um, explanation for this violation is not that there is a triplet um, um, superconducting um, phase or Cooper pair with a triplet um, phase, but um, it is um, easing superconductivity, which also violates the Pauli limit. Now, um, how to calculate the superconductivity, we concentrate on the Cooper channel and then solve um, self-consistently this beta salpeta equation. We have um, the Cooper per um, vertex, um, the Cooper per with uh, momentum P and minus P is interacting with this other Cooper pair at K and minus K. And these two uh, momenta are now parameterized by these angles, theta and theta prime. And um, we now um, reabsorb um, the density of states and we define um, these new um, renormalized, um, if you wish, um, um, Cooper um, per vertices and, and this is actually the calculation that has now been, has to be done. So to give you some, some graphical insight, um, when we are at a filling factor of minus 2.8, we have a um, Fermi line that has um, this central shape around the K point. Um, if we now define a Cooper pair at, um, with respect to lambda at a angle theta, and we have to now calculate these derivatives with respect to K and the energy along, uh, along this line and then um, um, include this um, vertex here. And here also you see the difference now in the doping. If you are at this optimal doping or almost optimal doping of 2.8, we have this um, Fermi lines, but when you're now in the regime where you are outside the superconducting regime, you have, um, these, uh, these um, elliptic curves, which are totally different. So this is one um, indication that there are different um, instabilities um, at work or different strengths. Now, let me continue with this argument 
um, of the um, effective Cooper per vertex, we can now um, derive um, renormalization group equations by introducing this cutoff. And it is always important now to, to have a good starting point. So what, so for large um, lambda, for a large cutoff, um, this, the, 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 um, the, the approach can be um, done um, perturbatively. Um, and um, usually the starting point is an RPA interaction for um, the Hubbard U, which was proposed long time ago by Scalapino and um, co-workers. Um, I told you that the Hubbard U is actually um, not the, the scale that is important when you're not looking at spin um, um, polarized states. Um, important is actually the long range interaction. And therefore one has to start with a um, modified um, RPA um, um, vertex, um, which is really including this long um, range um, interaction. So what we calculate is this typical um, particle hole um, polarization. So this is the RPA screening and also this um, particle particle scattering um, vertex. And um, we parameterize now the K and the K prime by these angles. And we can Fourier transform this and we expand this and we obtain these Fourier um, um, coefficients. And um, these, co um, these coefficients can be now labeled by these irreducible representations of the underlying symmetry group um, C3b. And um, what now we can treat each channel independently. We can do the RG calculations, uh, um, renormalization, and we see that this is the, the, the renormalized vertex, which still depends on this, uh, on this running coupling. And you can see that if one of these initial coefficients, um, expansion coefficients, is negative, um, there will be a scale at which this one is comparable to the one um, and this one blows up, and this is the indication of an instability um, where, where superconductivity sets in. And this gives rise now to the definition of a scale, and doing the calculation, we obtain a, a critical energy scale of 1k, as I told you before, and um, we see um, that two different irreproducible um, representations are actually very close in, in, the, in the most strongest uh, um, um, pairing um, channel um, pre present. Now, what has been calculated, um, what, what has been really measured in more detail than the order parameter, the order parameter is still kind of an um, open question experimentally, is the hole density. And we have, um, in order to make contact to experiment, also calculated the hole density within our um, theory. Let me run you through very quickly through the argument. Um, we do a semi-classical theory, and we are only in concerned with these um, equal um, uh, uh, these um, energy um, contours at equal um, uh, these energy contours at equal energy, and um, we have two different um, regimes um, for for closed um, orbits. We have circular uh, trigonal warped regimes. We can also have these elliptic regimes, and all these can be now treated. Um, within the so-called Chambers formula, we calculate the hole density from the um, hole resistivity tensor, um, which is obtained from this conductivity tensor. And um, it turns out that the hole density is always equal to the electronic density. And even for the trigonal warp case, um, there's only a small correction, but it's also almost one. And this means that since we have this um, gap at at half filling, um, that we have this cartoon, we have a linear um, dependence now. And in this region here, open trajectories play a role. And these open trajectories are, of course, induced by Van Hove singularities. And this is the full band structure. We have um, Van Hove singularities um, always um, here labeled at one and two and three and four. This is the first valence band, second valence band. And of course, they always come in pairs, uh, in three, in, in triples, um, due to the underlying symmetry. And um, we can now um, treat an arbitrary Van Hove singularity and calculate the whole um, density. And this has been done here in this um, treatment. Um, we have to introduce a cutoff because the orbits are now not close but unbounded. But we can treat an arbitrary 
um, van Hove singularity with, with these coefficients alpha minus and alpha plus. So these, these coefficients are obtained from the band structure. We, we look at, for example, here, we zoom in, we can, um, we can make a line cut, we can fit the, the masses here, and, and these masses are then um, plugged in. And doing so, we obtain the following results. Um, as I told you, we have here these straight lines, but then um, there are Van Hove singularities. And these Van Hove singularities are very closely at the location where also the experiments see some kind of fluctuations here from the, um, from the or departure from the linear behavior. So this is taken from this work um, by Pablo Jarillo Herrero. So we are optimistic that our approach actually is also um, um, quantitatively correct and not only qualitatively. And if, you, if we introduce now some kind of disorder, we more or less can, can match the, the whole density from experiment. Now in the, in the remaining two minutes, let me very quickly tell you some results on quadrilayer graphene. Um, again, if you don't have any correlation, you are not in this flat band regime. So one has to include correlations, but if, if, if one does so, um, the, 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 there's the strong flat band regime, which is very similar now, the quadrilayer than the, the trilayer. So it's almost um, the same. The only difference is now that the Dirac cone here is doubly degenerated because you have this extra layer. And um, if you now do the heart rate fog calculations again at this half filled um, um, valence band, um, you see also symmetry, the valley symmetry breaking. So this um, seems to be um, consistent with the trilayer results, but there's not really a gap here. So this other Dirac cone maybe mixes too much. Um, and, and, and there's also a spin polarized phase for, for larger use. So um, our conclusion is a bit that um, it is not as clearly seen as in trilayer effect, um, as in trilayer, and we, we, we expect that there's, there's a possible odd even effect that actually for even numbers, this, this, part, uh, this superconductivity is not as stable as for, for, for odd numbers. Nevertheless, um, this, this, um, we, we see this valley symmetry breaking, and, and my conclusion now, um, or my first conclusion would be of this talk that, well, we see bilayer graphene, their spin polarized state is actually a bit more dominant. We, we see it um, strongly. Um, the trilayer um, clearly shows valley polarized state, and the quadrilayer is maybe somewhere in between, but this is now for the first um, guess of parameters. If we now fine tune the parameters, we can. We are now um, quite sure that um, for for other larger dielectric functions, um, also bilayer shows um, valley symmetry breaking. We we see different uh, similar band structures, and so we we propose actually this universal mechanism for for any layered um, twisted structure that um, there, there should be valley symmetry breaking and then eventually leading to Ising superconductivity. So um, with this, I want to thank my um, collaborator, Jose Gonzalez, um, um, who works at the um, Instituto de Estructura de Materia in, in Serrano, or the TESIC. And um, we are now um, working also with two um, PhD students, um, Miguel and Israel. So thank you for your attention and um, and let me also flash this um, um, summer school. So thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> it was a, a great talk uh, with uh, a lot of information. So very, very interesting. Uh, we have already a question. So uh, I will allow you to open your mics. Uh, so let me see. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Thank yeah. you very much for the for the very nice talk. Um, you explain the origin of the magic angle by this argument of hybridization and how the band flattening takes place. Uh, is there a way to understand all the magic angles with that, or is it just the particular case you showed? Yeah, that's that's a, that's a good question. Um, um, probably, if you go down further, um, you can see also different. Um, um, resonances and um, 
maybe maybe um, another way of of seeing it is also in the real space in real space you can um, you can argue that the size of the Moe cell has to match also the wavelength of the localized electrons inside and i think mm -hmm. there you can really have these higher order um, the magic angles really in the resonances of this localization approach. So the, the, the cartoon I showed you in this, in this aspect, it's probably not as easy, but, but actually you're right. You can also try to do it. And, and, and people I think have also tried. What happens is the following, I, I will just flash it quickly. Um, so what, what happens is that you push down this band and then if you twist it further, this band actually becomes negative and, and, and mm -hmm. this band becomes positive. So you have a band inversion. I and see. then there will come a time uh, or a twist angle where this reverts again. And so this, this is kind of the, the argument why, why there are these magic angles in, in higher, higher orders as well. I see. Thank you. Mm -hmm. well, uh, are there more questions? Well, while people, uh, Alfredo, you can unmute yourself. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you, Tobias, for this nice talk. Uh, as you know, I, I'm, I'm following this topic, but not so closely as you do, of course. And, and I have uh, a question regarding the effect of the substrate. Mm -hmm. Suppose that the uh, uh, breaking of the sublattice symmetry is. Mm -hmm. is Detrimental for superconductivity, and uh, but in, in your your theory, you're breaking all symmetries, no? Yes, um, but I'm not breaking them externally. So um, what what in experiment is done, as you say, the, you you can break the C two symmetry. Uh, sorry, sorry, the C three symmetry. So you, um, uh, on the C well C two uh, symmetry in in the sense that you protect the Dirac cones by the C2T symmetry. C2 is the, the, the parity mm -hmm. and T is the, the inversion of, of time. And, mm -hmm. and this protects the Dirac cone. And you can now um, break this one um, by, by a substrate. And, and you can also break it if you break time reversal symmetry by a magnetic field. So both of these um, externally broken symmetry phases have been um, investigated and actually different phases arise. So what, what we actually do so far is not breaking this externally, um, but, but only, um, yeah, it's in interaction induced. So um, the, the combination of all this would be another um, topic, but uh, so far we have concentrated really just for the intrinsic um, symmetry break. I see, I see. You, you, you think you, you can introduce this uh, also in the theory, of course. We, we can introduce this. Actually, we are now doing it with an, a magnetic field. So we are, mm -hmm. we are, we are looking at um, the, the, the magnetic field, so how this uh, changes. And we can also break, of course, um, the, the rotational symmetry. And um, always, um, when you break some symmetries, you have some price to pay numerically. And therefore, mm -hmm. we, are, we are not as as quickly in breaking all these symmetries because then you have to to do um yeah um we use a lot of these internal symmetries especially the c3 symmetry and then you, you can kind of reduce the the brion zone to a third and, and this makes calculations easier if you now leave this one um, mm -hmm. free um the the programs will 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 take longer and so it's not as easy for us now okay. to do that but this is definitely a plan to do Okay. okay, thank you. Thank you. Any more questions? Okay, there is one in the chat. Let me see. Um, uh, okay, so uh, this is by uh, Jing Wang. Thanks for your kind talk. Uh, you send the uh, RG. We can qualitatively judge which candidate state is the dominant one. How can we evaluate the critical temperature of phase transition? And what can we do to describe the physics below the very energy scale determ determined by RG at which the susceptibility is divergent? So maybe you can see it in the chat. So oh yeah, I probably it's 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 a long it's question, yes. yeah. and this the, the, the question. Yeah, let me see. Okay, yeah. Um, so maybe I start just from the from the from the beginning. Um, 
and the how are we i oh know i cannot change i have to well, probably stop the presentation stop something yeah uh, but let me let me do it then and this oh. way um so the the rg is is the following idea that you that you expand the so this is the initial um, uh, beta psi beta equation for the vertex and you can now formulate this equation with respect to this effective vertex and um, this vertex now is subjected to this renormalization group approach and um, we need this initial condition which is um, given by by this rpa and now by expanding this vertex in the beginning we can um, separate all the different channels with respect to these um, irreducible representations and all of these channels now flow independently and whenever one of these um, coefficients is negative you can see just by integrating up now this flow equation um, we obtain this result depending still on, on on lambda and you can see that with a negative coefficient um, the the denominator will become eventually zero and um, the this energy scale where this happens um, is obtained just by by resolving this equation and this is just this um, this equation here and now um, this is the coefficient that has been initially um, determined by by expanding the initial vertex and um, this eigenvalue lambda which is here called v um, can be determined and um, whenever this is negative um, we can expect some superconducting um, instability and it turns out that we have some rather high values negative values and these high values translate now um, to this critical scale of 1k and they are they are um, they are now um, classified by this irreducible representations and now i probably have to read the the second part of the of the question what can we do to describe the physics below the very energy scale determined by the rg yeah and um, this is this is an perturbative rg and um, the, the perturbative RG um, cannot go beyond um, at all. I mean, this is, I mean the, 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 this is a breakdown and it is only um, signaling to you that um, some, some crossover phase transition takes place. We cannot go beyond. And, and this would be um, a different um, type of, of physics. You, you would then have to go from the strong coupling approach and, and we, our approach is always the recoupling. So we, we take, um, we start from the non-interacting theory, then add perturbatively the interaction and then look for the breakdown and not the other way around. Okay, I hope this has been clear. Okay, there's another question. Uh, someone who raised your hand. Yeah. You have to unmute yourself. You have to unmute yourself. No, it should work. Um, thanks for the talk. Um, <clears throat> I was one have had a question about the last uh, uh, couple of minutes, uh, the four layer and possibly more. Uh, did you compare that to experiment, or do you have anything to say about the comparison to experiment? There are no. experiments on four and five layers. Uh, yeah, I, I think they they are, and even even larger. Um, we we are not at that point where we can really compare. The problem with comparing to experiment is always um, what do you compare to, and and the um, one way is the the, the um, whole density. So this is one one way of comparing it, at least from from our point of of calculating um, things. And um, we did not do the 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 calculations there for the whole density. Yes, it do. <clears throat> I guess one of the experiments showed that in in five layers the uh, superconductivity seems to naively at least extend uh, beyond the what you would call filling factor four. And I was wondering whether you oh had any um, possible explanation on that. Um, it it is it is 
probably um, related to these DIRA cones, which when, when, when you now fill, I mean, these, these filling factors now have to be taken with, with care because you always fill always the, the DIRA cone as well. And when you have no, the DIRA cone as well, you have to count very, this, is, this can also be seen in other, in, in other, I have to, yeah, let me see. Look at, look at this maybe here. You can also see it here. Um, the hole density here, um, is actually not going to zero at minus four. And the, well, our explanation is it is, it is due to the, the, to the hole density of the Dura cone actually. Hmm. And, and, this, and the same um, should be also be considered in, in this multi-layer where it is even more, more acute because they are doubly or, or triply um, degenerate these Dura cones that appear there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Okay, well. Are there any more questions? Well, if not, let's thank uh, Tobias again for this uh, very, very nice talk. You can unmute yourselves, you want to clap. <laughs> <laughs> and um, okay, and so we, for finishing, uh, just uh, remind you that then we will have a seminar next week. Uh, uh, this will be a hybrid format uh, and uh, done in uh, the uh, from the university, the Universidad Autónoma de Madrid. The speaker will be Giorgio Benedict uh, from uh, Donostia International Physics Center and uh, Universidad de Milano Bicocca. Uh, he will talk about the surface electron phonon interaction at conduction surfaces. So I hope to 